on Book TV's Afterwards. Shoshana Zuboff examines the growing business of collecting and selling consumer data. She's interviewed by Nilay Patel, editor-in-chief of The Verge. Afterwards is a weekly interview program with relevant guest hosts interviewing top nonfiction authors about their latest work. Welcome. It's so good to see you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, so I love the book. Uh, I think it's incredibly important. So I'm going to start with a very basic question. Of course. Which is a question that you attempt to answer in the, in the first section of the book. What is surveillance capitalism? What is your definition of it? Okay, good. Let's start with that. So let's back up a little bit and give it a tiny bit of context. Yeah. It has long been understood that in the history of capitalism, part of the, the key way that capitalism evolves is by taking things that live outside the marketplace, outside the market dynamic, and bringing them into the market so that they can be sold and bought. And the famous historian Karl Polanyi wrote about the uh, basic mechanisms, mechanisms of industrial capitalism. And the idea was that human activity, kinds of things that people did every day in their homes, in their cottages, was claimed for the marketplace and reborn as labor. Mm -hmm. And that made it possible for labor to be sold and to be bought. And that made wage labor possible and factory work and all the things that became the hallmarks of modernity. Mm -hmm. In a similar way, nature was subordinated to the market dynamic and reborn as real estate or land. So let's fast forward a century. Now, right at the beginning of the 21st century, sur surveillance capitalism was invented. The insight was we can take human experience, specifically private human experience, and we can bring that into the marketplace to be sold as behavioral data. Mm -hmm. So your, the, your, your Googles, your Facebooks are saying, you're not tracking your behavior on the internet, and we can sell that in aggregate to other people. We are, we are coming into the space of your private experience uninvited. We are doing that typically in ways that are secret and designed to evade your awareness. We are registering your experience in a variety of ways, and then we are translating that into behavioral data that can be fed into our production pro process, mm -hmm. which these days we call machine intelligence. Yeah. That machine intelligence goes to work, and it produces predictions. I call those prediction products. So it produces predictions of your behavior, what you will do now, soon, and later. Those prediction products are sold into new kinds of markets that trade exclusively in behavioral futures. Think of it as a new kind of derivative. So one thing that struck me in the opening of the book was you have a discussion of Adam Smith. Yes. The specialization of labor changed who we are. Right? As we became factory workers, as we became industrialized society, as people became their jobs, it changed who we are. Yes. And your thesis is surveillance capitalism is once again changing who we are because those predictions are not necessarily just predictions. They become persuasive suggestions. Are you, are you seeing that connection f like fully realized, or is this a, a warning that you're giving? How, how do you, where are we on that spectrum? Well, you've asked such an interesting question um, because this really goes to the, the heart of, of the book, in a sense, because my, my, my thesis in the book is that we've really got to understand the, the mechanisms, the imperatives, the internal logic of surveillance capitalism. But in the end, this moves beyond economics, it moves beyond the commercial and, and the business side of things to really um, creating a new vision of society. And in the industrial world created by industrial capitalism, 
you know, we had a vision of society. Many of our viewers will remember, you know, Charlie Chaplin, Modern Times. That was, of course, a parody of this new vision of society that works like clockwork and works like a factory where, you know, it's not only mass production and mass consumption, but mass society. And everybody has their role to play and everybody has their, their part and makes their contribution and it's very hierarchical and, and so forth. Uh, standardization, conformity, all of those kinds of values, those social qualities came out of the nature of industrial capitalism. Well now, what is the social vision of surveillance capitalism? And my argument is it stems from the whole machine learning framework. In the machine learning framework, you have various computers and devices and so forth. Let's imagine self-driving cars. Mm -hmm. Let's imagine a, a fleet of self-driving cars. Well, as the intelligence of the cars learns something, it's not like one of the cars learns and the others are all on their individual learning curves and they may or may not learn that same thing or they may learn it tomorrow or a year from now. As soon as one car learns, they all learn, right? And in, and in some of these architectures, you know, there's a central hub that's agglomerating the data and doing the learning and then feeding that back to all of the individual parts. So the point is that as one learns, they all learn and they all learn the same thing and they all move in the same direction as far as the, the learning goes. So if one is no longer going to make the mistake of not stopping at a, at a train uh, crossing, mm -hmm. you know, then all of them are learning that same thing. This is a hive. This is a hive mentality. This is a hive structure. And as I have studied how the surveillance capitalists themselves think about society and think about how their breakthroughs are going to be transposed to the, the control and functioning of society, the idea is that society itself becomes a hive organization where we all move in tune with what the, you know, the frontier of the machine intelligence is at any given moment. So there's, there's machine learning taking place, and that is being translated through the digital surround to all the devices and all the things that surround us, these digital interfaces. And in a variety of ways, they are nudging and coaxing, tuning, hurting us, shaping, modifying our behavior in the direction of this one learning. Now, we're talking about surveillance capitalism. So the learning isn't just learning for learning's sake. And it's not learning for the sake of democracy or for the sake of a better society. It's learning for the sake of better commercial outcomes. Mm -hmm. So now the final piece of the puzzle, Nilay, is that we're learning you know, uh, and being shaped and modified to move together in the direction that favor surveillance capitalism's customers and the commercial outcomes that they seek. I always wonder, I have so many questions to ask. My, the primary one that I find myself asking, both as I read your book and as I cover the industry, is who fundamentally are those customers? Is it, is it turtles all the way down? Is it we're buying ads and we're buying ad tracking and there's more ad tracking because at some point human beings have to make a transaction. They have to engage in more, a more classical type of capitalism. They have to buy a product or service so that the, those companies can then pay Google or Facebook for the advertising that is their primary product. And I think that that's often lost. So when you think about those commercial outcomes, how do you see those companies that are actually trying to sell you a product changing in the model that you're describing? This is so important. What we're seeing is, is this new logic is, is going full circle. It's spreading across the economy through every economic sector. So it was invented and elaborated at Google. It spread to Facebook. It became the default model for 
So uh, can I quote you, actually? Of course you You have may. an amazing line. Uh, Google invented and perfected surveillance capitalism in the same way that GM invented and perfected managerial capitalism. Okay, so you're, we're, you're right with me. Yeah. Because here's, here's where I'm going. I'm going right to GM and to Ford. So, we, you know, first it becomes the default model, this new logic of accumulation, the default model in Silicon Valley for the startups, for the apps, because they don't have an obvious product to make and to sell. And there are m many ways that these companies could have figured out how to monetize and build value and institutionalize a new value proposition for actual people you know, <laughs> who are now called users. But they didn't do that because as soon as this path to monetization was discovered, it's like uh, as the crow flies. They skipped over all the difficult kind of institution building that uh, an economist like Schumpeter uh, describes in his work. They took the, that little snippet about creative destruction but left behind all the important learning in Schumpeter about the years and decades and even centuries it takes to build robust new models of um, economic production that are aligned with the, the real needs of people in their society. Straight to this new monetization process. Okay, but now because these uh, surveillance revenues have been so lucrative, so startlingly successful. We see companies in every sector migrating in this direction. And here's where we come full circle to the Ford Motor Company, where mass production began with the breakthrough to the Model T back in the very early days of the 20th century. Now, as many of our uh, viewers will know, the auto industry is in a global slump. Car sales are at a sustained low. A way out of this doesn't, uh, there's no way out of this. It's obvious on the horizon. The CEO of Ford Motor is now saying that the new path to profit margin for the Ford Motor Company is going to be monetizing data mm -hmm. from their drivers. And what he says is that we have 100 million people driving uh, cars with um, the, little, the little blue ovals. You know, we've got um, – yeah, I, I just said – yes, 100 million people in vehicles driving these uh, Ford cars. And he's very excited about the amount of data that we can get from these vehicles. And he says, we've got Ford Credit. In Ford Credit, we, know, we already know everything about you. Mm -hmm. So now we put together what you're doing in your car, what you're saying in your car, where you're going in your car. We put that together with all this background information we have about you who you are, what you buy, how you shop, et cetera, et cetera, your mortgages, all your financial information. And we have this robust, deep dive data about you. And he says, who wouldn't want these data? <laughs> these are the, da the, the data that we can leverage for a new frontier of, of monetization. So what happens? You asked about products. Don't we still need products? What happens in this situation, and we're seeing this in all kinds of situations, is that the product becomes a loss leader, yeah. right? It's a, it's a um, supply chain interface for behavioral data. And so this began with the Android strategy way mm -hmm. back when. The Android, of course, was sold at a much lower price point than the iPhone. And the reason was... They wanted to create as frictionless an opportunity as possible for all the data that could come with mobile. Yeah. And so, you know, give it away if you can. You know, definitely below cost. 
because really it's a data gathering device. It's a supply chain interface. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I've spent years of my life reporting on Android and Google's Android strategy and the twists and turns that it's taken. And they say everything that you're saying. All these companies say their goals are exactly as you described, but their tone, their optimism around it is strikingly different, right? <laughs> uh, so, you know, Google made Android, they gave it, they licensed it for free, and their goal was, hey, Microsoft has a monopoly in these markets. If we don't enter with a radical new strategy, we're going to lose mobile, and then Google might disappear because Microsoft will extend its monopoly over your user experience to search, and that we're a search company. So we'll give away Android, and we won't charge anybody for it, and you'll just do search, and that's where we still make our money. And then they can leverage that into maps and assistant and all the other things that they do. Um, you described endpoints. Microsoft, which is I want to talk about, you cover extensively in your book. Um, Microsoft flat out says our strategy is intelligent edge devices that connect to an intelligent cloud. They're very proud. I mean, this is their strategy. It will point to it and say we collect data at the edge. We do smart devices at the edge, uh, and that feeds our cloud business, which Microsoft depending on the day right now, is the most valuable company uh, on, on, the, on the markets. Right. So th they're saying these things very proudly, right? And you're, what, what I'm trying to get at is the, the difference between their excitement over it and their being rewarded for it. Yes. Both, you know, Android's <laughs> very popular. Yes. Um, Microsoft stock is very popular. Yeah. Uh, Microsoft products are popular in IT. And your sort of warning tone, like where does that difference in tone come from? Like what about it specifically scares you? Yeah, such an interesting question. Um, I, I think there are a couple things to say about that. One thing is um, there's, while you're right, they're saying these things and there's the, you know, the public um, pitch and the public euphoria and all of that. They're also saying other things to each other. Mm -hmm. And occasionally those other things make it into, <laughs> thanks to journalists like, you know, the, the journalists at The Verge and, and the journalists at ProPublica and the journalists in the, you know, the, the, the Times and The Guardian and, and just so many journalists who have done, in my view, just heroic work, you know, really digging into these situations. Plus, then, you know, I, I listen to earnings calls, I read letters, I read reports, I read, you know, all, all kinds of sources that aren't typically, you know, perused by the, by the reading public. And then um, over the years, we also see documents that get leaked, internal reports that finally, you know, get, get to the public in one way or another. So there's also a difference between what they're saying, you know, in the press release mm -hmm. and what they're saying internally. Even in the case of Android, I know in the book I include some um, very telling quotes about the Android strategy at the time, where there were some people in Google who were arguing, "Hey, you know, we've got to we've got to make a margin on this phone. It's it's crazy to sell it so cheap." And other people saying, "No, if we can get data through this phone, it's worth it to us to give it away." Mm -hmm. All right, now. The second point is that it's, oh, it, surveillance capitalism is an economic logic that has been carefully concealed, designed to be indecipherable, designed to be hidden, designed for the ignorance of the people uh, who have now been converted into free sources of raw material, mm -hmm. thinking of behavioral data as raw material. We are now merely the free sources of raw material. Once we thought these services were free, but now they think that we're free. Mm -hmm. you know, so we've gone through that, that flip. So once you understand how the pieces of surveillance capitalism work, how they articulate, how they, how they work together, then you understand that unless they're getting behavioral data, at scale, at scope, and hopefully later we'll talk about in terms of these economies of action that I write about, um, they can't make competitive predictions. 
And without competitive predictions, they can't be successful in their new futures marketplaces, these behavioral futures marketplaces. And so all of this depends upon these surplus flows, these data flows. So once you begin to take those same happy lines, you know, we've got the smart edge and we're feeding the smart cloud and so forth, once you now put them into the context of how this logic really works, they become alarmingly revelatory, <laughs> you know. But until you understand this context, it just seems like sort of every other piece of boilerplate. You know, but you put one piece together and another piece together and another piece, together, and and then slowly the thing emerges. So I look at it like um, you know that old fable about the blind men and the elephant, or mm -hmm. shall we call it the blind people and the elephant? Yeah. Uh, you know, and really I've spent the last seven years trying to map the elephant, and I think once you get the picture of the elephant. Uh, this changes, and you can never read those lines again, Eli, without hearing and understanding something very different from what they thought they were conveying to the public. So let me push on that just a little bit. Of course. Um, because I, I, I tend to agree with you, but you talk a lot about you know, the, the thousand contracts you are effectively signing when you buy a Nest thermostat, yes. right? Like, the end, you have to enter into some bargain. I used to be a lawyer, so I think about these contracts. Yes, yes, yes. It's insanity. No one yes. reads them. They're recursive. Uh, one references another one with references another Infinite one. regress. <laughs> uh, and none of it is backed by yeah. law uh, that, I, that I understand. Um, but at some point, you know, there's the idea that you, you buy the smart thermostat, you put it on your wall, you sign the contracts, and then it, it provides some utility to you you might not otherwise have gotten if it was just a regular thermostat with a regular programmable on-off system. Absolutely. Right? We know power prices in your region are spiking. We're going to change your thermostat settings to save you some money. We know, uh, we know how long it takes your house to heat up. We're going to run it earlier and shut it down slower because we've, run, we've built an algorithm that can predict your specific model of, of furnace. That's like one small example. I would say Consumers, at least as far as I can tell, tend to love Google and Amazon. Right? They provide this like enormous amount of utility to them. They tend to hate Facebook right now. I think the amount of utility Facebook gets versus the amount of crisis it seems to constantly be in has shifted. But you see the utility from some of these services. Does that utility outweigh the, the trade we're making? Well. My argument is these utilities are indeed grand, mm -hmm. and it's what we had always hoped for from the digital. So uh, let me give our, our viewers a quick example, if I may. You know that I, I begin the book with the example of the AWARE home. Mm -hmm. So the AWARE home was a project of uh, computer scientists and engineers, Georgia Tech, the year 2000. And it was all about what we call today the smart home with you know, many of the same goals to inform the occupants of the home of these kinds of processes, these um, abilities to you know, optimize how the home runs and functions. Maybe it saves you money. Maybe it makes it more efficient and effective. Um, also, you know, things that can aid the occupants in their, their health and their self-care and their communication with their families and you know, all, all of those things. When the engineers put together the schematics for the aware home, the idea was a simple closed loop. There are two nodes on the loop. One is the sensors embedded in the home itself, and the other is the occupants of the home. Mm -hmm. And the designers imagined maybe a, a wearable computer or, or some other kind of device that the occupants had. All the data from the home went to the occupants. And then they had tools to figure out what it means. It was theirs to decide if and how to share, what, if anything, to do with the data, and so forth. That's the counterpoint to the Nest thermostat, which, as you've noted, the analyses now say you put one Nest thermostat on your wall, 
And if you're going to be vigilant about these things, you've got a thousand privacy policies to review. More importantly, if you don't agree to the Nest privacy policy, you've got it on your wall, but guess what? You're losing the functionality <laughs> that you looked forward to in the first place. They stop supporting the, the system. They stop updating it. Um, they actually say that things can happen, like maybe your pipes will freeze or something else will go wrong because the functionality is no longer going to be supported. Mm -hmm. So now there is a quid pro quo. There is a kind of hostage taking. Yeah. It's my data in return for the functionality. Now we can keep talking about what is the harm in their having all my data because that's a very important conversation. For now, let's just assume that I've got some arguments that I believe are compelling to yeah. say that there are harms that go beyond known harms, that go beyond known economic harms. But we'll table that for a moment. The point is that they're holding this dreamy, swell, new functionality hostage to my being, being, being willing to hand over my experience for their translation into behavioral data for their prediction products and futures markets. My argument is we signed on to the digital as a new era of empowerment and the democratization of knowledge. That's what I want. Mm -hmm. That's what we all deserve. We are 21st century citizens. We live in advanced democratic societies. Some. Well, we're, there, we're hitting some speed bumps right yeah. now. Also, another conversation. I believe our democracies are holding and will hold. Mm -hmm. we've, we've, we've been in tough situations before. We've come through them. I believe very deeply in the robustness and sanctity of democracy. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe that as citizens of a democratic society, we should not be held hostage to these bargains that are made on the part of private firms who do not enjoy the legitimacy of the vote, who are self-authorized in their claiming of our experience and then what they do with the data from our, from our experience. Uh, we have no knowledge about what they're doing. It is not accessible to us. We have no influence over it. And it is expressly done in a way that bypasses and usurps our decision rights. I think the companies would have two responses to this. Um, one is a, a very classic one, which is a security argument. And the other one is uh, a more market-based argument, and we can talk about that. The, the first one, the security argument, is, well, when we put compute in the user's home, when we gave everybody a Windows PC, they forgot to install the updates. We couldn't sense when the network was taking an infection. So it is better for us to centralize management and keep the bad actors out, right? And we can do this more effectively. If you run your own mail server, it is more likely that you will not be a good IT person. So just Gmail, we'll just do it for you and we'll prevent state actor phishing attacks, which they're able to do. We can block spam more effectively. Does that seem compelling to you, the, the centralization <laughs> of security argument? This is a rhetorical question, right? This is we're going to keep bad actors out the way Facebook is keeping bad actors out sure, yeah, or mean, the way Google keeps bad, bad actors out. I mean, you know, I think that there is, if there, I think those arguments were made at a time um, when, first of all, surveillance capitalism was not yet prevalent, mm -hmm. uh, when per, there were more security issues as far as viruses and so forth. But, but the, the number of security issues has gone down because they have centralized the security model. Yes, but in centralizing the security model, you know, every, um, how does that, that saying go, you know, close the window, open the door. <laughs> uh, in this case, it's a negative fable, you yeah. know, because, yeah, so we're more protected from some viruses. And even that's not perfect. But the fact of the matter is that in centralizing now, the harms that come, the corruption of these systems that are centralized is now a corruption as in the hive model that affects every single one of us. 
it's not just the corruption on Shoshana's or Neelai's computer, mm -hmm. it's the corruption on the global system that can shift elections and transform the sanctity of democratic elections. So I think that we are well past the argument for centralization. And I also think that just from a technical point of view, mm -hmm. we have many more tools for treating security in a decentralized atmosphere than we had, you know, 20 years ago at, at the beginning of this story. So, so that's one thing. What, what was your, what was the, well, the, the, the second, second part one. of your so that's question? That's the first one. And okay. I, I tend to agree with you, although I'm often called to help fix my family's computers and there's a part of me that says, well, you've just centralized the management of these PCs onto me. So, I mean, but maybe you're I not, you're not a corporation. You're not a corporation, Eli. If you're part of the family, sure. you know, then there you have aligned interest with your parents and making sure that their aware home functions the way they want it to. Yeah, but I, I can lead from one to the, 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 the market question, which I was going to ask. Which okay, is, let's do that. They can ask me for help, but what I what I'm aware of is many people are much worse at managing their computing devices than they think they are. Uh, and as the computing devices get smart, as they collect data, protecting that data is important. So you have to make some choice of how you're going to do it. Most people are sort of blissfully unaware that they're making that choice, which is a, a problem that you'd point to. And so the market question is, well, they're buying our products. They're choosing this. They're choosing to buy an iPhone where Apple will just push a security update that happens to your, they will change the bits on your phone overnight. You know, if you sign, if you set the settings in the App Store, now third party vendors who are authorized by Apple can come through and change the bits on your phone to make it more secure to push more features. That trade off is one that the, the people are choosing to make. The consumers, that's their, I, I don't think that's my argument, but that would be the company's argument. Well, they're buying the smart thermostat instead of the dumb one. The dumb ones are still in the market. And so you're buying it, you're making this choice to let us into your home in this way. You don't seem to think, I, I can tell you don't think that's very <laughs> compelling, but why do you think the consumers are, are sort of overwhelmingly, I mean, I run a tech website. They're interested I, in new yeah, products, I can tell you. <laughs> Where does that interest come from if it, if it works against us so much? Yes. Well, I'm, again, I'm not brushing off this question at all. It's a yeah. hugely important question uh, for all kinds of reasons, including... The, the market opportunities and the market failures represented by, yeah. by this question. Um, all right, so what we have is a very um, contradictory situation. Surveillance capitalism has rooted and flourished in the past 20 years, um, including the, its representation now in virtually every product that has the word smart in front of it, Mm -hmm. is a supply chain interface for surveillance capitalism. Uh, from the Nest thermostat to the, uh, you know, Alexa digital assistant and everything in between. Can I give you my, my favorite example? Go ahead. I, I do agree with you. Uh, I was just at CES, which is the big consumer electronics show in Las Vegas. It's the uh, surveillance capitalism show. <laughs> it's, it is remarkable. Uh, Google and Amazon are there in force with their assistants. Uh, but I met with the CTO of Vizio, which is... Uh, one of the biggest TV vendors in the country. And most controversial. And among the most controversial, they've been sued. Singled out by the FTC. And I said, and I, I have a Vizio TV. Um, and it, you know, I have a router that tells me when things are pinging the network. My, the Vizio TV pings the router like crazy. Um, when it's not performing optimally, it's literally once a second it's talking to the network, which is a lot. Um, I said, why do you do this data collection? And the answer it was very clear. No, no shading, no hiding. Well, we sell the TVs at cost, and we make our money selling one movie, <laughs> one ad, one TV <laughs> show at a time, right? Like, I'm just trying to cover the cost of this piece of hardware because all of this recommendation engine work that I do is where we make money over the seven-year lifespan of the TV. Because you hang a TV on the wall, it sits there for seven years in one transaction. And that leads all the way to, well, if it's just a dumb TV, I will have to charge a higher price. And people won't pay those prices because this market is cutthroat. So I agree. The, the, the devices themselves are becoming this, this apparatus of this ongoing relationship. But again, well, it's not necessarily a relationship. Right. But again, the, people seem to be choosing. They seem to not. There's okay. not a huge market for more expensive yeah, yeah, yeah. TVs so that don't track. So the key right? word there is seem. 
people seem to be choosing. Okay. All right. So what we understood with Vizio, since you brought that up, and I do write about Vizio mm -hmm. in the book, and the, you know, the, um, the, um, you know, the legal case that was made against Vizio, and that's a perfect example of designed for ignorance. Mm -hmm. So one reason that people are quote choosing is because they have no idea what's going on. Not because we're stupid, but because these operations are designed for us not to, 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 to know that they're even going on, let alone what their purpose is and what they're doing. So, and you are a, a tech expert. You're one of the top people in the tech world. And you're asking the manufacturer, like, why are you doing this? <laughs> I knew the answer to the okay, question. well, I was excited to get well, it. Well, it still makes a good story. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, all right. So, we simply don't know, and we don't know not because we're stupid, but because it, it's all been designed for us not it's to not know. Part of the transaction. That's right. right. And so, well, it's designed to be outside of our awareness. It's designed to be indecipher indecipherable. It's designed to be hidden. So that's one thing. In the book, I, I ask the question, how do they get away with it? Mm -hmm. And I answer it with 16 reasons. So there's no one simple reason. But um, if we zoom out from that a little bit, I look at the, um, the uh, many, many significant pieces of survey research that have been done even just within the past 10 years. There are about 50 or so um, significant pieces of survey research that come out of UPenn and other great universities and so forth. And they ask people, um, uh, you know, basically, how do you feel about these companies taking your data? Just without even knowing very much detail. Two of these surveys are a little bit inconclusive only because what the, what the researchers write is they say we couldn't get conclusive results because our participants in the survey didn't even know that the companies were taking data. <laughs> <laughs> but for most of these surveys, the outcome goes like this. People say when people learn what the companies are actually doing, mm -hmm. they disagree with it. They don't want to participate in it. We're talking like 70%, 80%, even more of respondents don't want any part of it, do not regard it as legitimate and as justified. And I go through all these numbers very carefully in the book. The issue is that now we're getting to a place where our choices are very limited. So either we're ignorant about it, and so we appear, we seem to be choosing it, or the alternatives are vanishing. So as you know, pretty soon, um, I've already gone through this in my own home. We have a, a flat screen TV in my home that's from, um, what do I want to say, like 2010 maybe, 2011? Mm -hmm. It's not, quote, smart. It's not internet enabled. It, you know, it has our, the fun all the functionality we need. Thank you very much. <laughs> if I want to replace that, it's going to be very difficult to get a TV oh, that's not internet enabled where everything can go out there, just like the Nest thermostat to an infinite regress of third parties that um, may be impossible for me to know about. Or like the, uh, the famous Kayla doll uh, that I write about um, where uh, folks discovered that um, uh, this doll that our children are talking to um, was actually picking up the, the, the dialogue of our children, those, quote, dialogue chunks. In the business, they're called dialogue chunks, were being sent to a company called Nuance Communications, which then sells dialogue chunks onto other uh, organizations and companies and institutions, including the CIA and the NSA, who are developing voice recognition software. Mm -hmm. Right? So this is the <laughs> coming from your, your child's nursery, 
you know, all the way to the CIA for their voice recognition software through these odd supply chains, right? So, so what we have is a situation where we are increasingly, you know, getting shunted into uh, having to purchase products and so on and so forth in a way that really cannot technically be called a choice because it's not an informed choice and it's, it's, a, it's a purchase that's happening because the alternatives are being foreclosed. Um, in, the, in the scholarly world, this um, difference between the fact that people keep buying this stuff or they keep using Google search or they keep, um, you know, they keep going onto Facebook, on the one hand, their behavior, and their attitudes, on the other hand, which in every survey, people say, no way. This is not legitimate. Mm -hmm. And the more I know about it, the less I approve of it and the less I want to participate in it. So there's a gap between attitudes and behavior. How do we make sense of that gap? And uh, in the literature, this is called the privacy paradox. But I say this is not a paradox. This is a market failure. This is a, a, um, a uh, really uh, uh, very aggressive mismatch between supply and demand. Because the demand, as expressed by the attitudes, is I want to be able to trust mm -hmm. the companies that I do business with. And if Vizio wants some of my data strictly to improve its service to me, I want to know exactly what it wants to take. I want to know exactly how it takes it. I want to uh, give my permission for every single step in that chain. I want 100% transparency of how those data are going to be used to improve the service to me. And if that's the case, we're back to the aware home model, mm -hmm. right? Where, yes, data is being collected, but 100% to improve the service to me. Um, so that's where the demand is. But where is the supply, Nilai? The supply is on some completely different trajectory, where the supply is responding to the demands of business customers who are paying to play in behavioral futures markets. So the demand of we the people, the demand of the users, if you will, is erased from the equation. The supply is being addressed to another realm, another kind of marketplace. This is what they call a two-sided market. Well, I would call it a two-sided market, and I know that Nobel Prize winning economists have called it a two-sided <laughs> market. But I beg to differ, mm -hmm. because what's happening here on the user side is not a market, precisely because there is no value exchange, there is no actual transaction, there is no supply and demand relation, relationship. There is no customer relationship. What's happening on this side is a group of users, an increasingly global group of users, who are merely the free, raw material that feeds the true marketplace, which is that alleged second side. So I believe that it is still a one-sided market the problem is it's not our side. So it's interesting you describe the market this way. Um, and I, I actually just want to talk about the companies, uh, sort of the, the big players here, because they're, they're very interesting. They position themselves very differently. Um, you know, if you go and ask, let's start with Apple. So if you go and ask Apple, they say, well, we do sell privacy. Right? They, they put up a billboard in Vegas at CES. Yes, they did. So, so to literally overhang the Google booth and say, what happens when the iPhone stays in the iPhone? You can make a lot of arguments about the fact that, you know, the most popular apps on the iPhone are social networking apps. But, you know, from in Apple's conception, this is what they sell. They're they're in the market and they say we know people care about privacy. We believe it's a human right. This is what we sell. Yes. Is that a does that work against your your conception of no, sort of not, unaware behavior? They all. are very successful. Not at all. I I think this is um, this gets us to a, a key key issue that I cannot stress the importance of it enough. Um, when we ask what are the solutions, mm -hmm. um, and we haven't asked that yet, and I'll, I'll wait for you yeah, to ask that, of course. Okay. <laughs> okay. So 
you know, one side of the solution has to do with our, our democratic institutions mm -hmm. and what, what pieces of the solution have to come from our democratic institutions. Yeah. But we also want to talk about competitive solutions. What are solutions that can come from the marketplace? Now, if you buy my argument here that we have a tremendous mismatch here between demand and supply, what that means is that I have just identified a world historic competitive opportunity. Somebody wants to step into that gap between supply and demand. They, have the, they literally have the opportunity to have every person on earth as their customer. Mm -hmm. Because you look at these surveys and what all the data suggests is that nobody freely, with informed consent, wants to buy into surveillance mm -hmm. capitalism. Right. Nobody wants surveillance capitalism. So if you can truly offer the kind of um, institutionalized, fully transparent, deeply consistent, profoundly trustworthy alternative, you are going to be coming into a market void where there has been a profound market failure. And in that market void, you have an opportunity for a world historic leap forward to restore the trajectory the trajectory of the digital future to the path that we were once on with the aware home when we thought that this was all about us mm -hmm. rather than about them. <laughs> you know, so uh, you bring up Apple. And I, the question in my mind is, is, you know, can Tim Cook, a shout out to Tim Cook, mm -hmm. can Tim Cook, can Apple, truly step into this space. Obviously, you know, we know that um, <coughs> Tim Cook spoke in Brussels uh, back in, in October and uh, made some very strong remarks mm -hmm. about Apple's commitment to entering precisely this space that I have described. Mm -hmm. And many of the first reactions to his strong remarks were uh, cynical because it's not difficult to point out inconsistencies in the Apple playbook. You've already pointed out some of them. We know Apple reverts to Google search uh, on the iPhone. Um, Apple is storing uh, user data in Chinese servers. Uh, there, you know, there, there, there just there's a whole litany of inconsistencies that one can point to. Perhaps no one of them uh, is a deal breaker, but you put them all together and you see that Apple still has work to do if it is going to fulfill the true uh, criteria, the institutional criteria that the economist Joseph Schumpeter laid out for a true uh, kind of economic uh, uh, leap forward that, that really moves the dial of, of economic history and is a, and is a truly you know, evolution of capitalism. All right, but, but this is Apple's opportunity to lose. Mm -hmm. Among the big tech firms, this is Apple's opportunity to lose. And um, I think that, you know, were Apple to roll up its sleeves and become as scrupulous as General Motors once was under the leadership of Alfred Sloan, to design the specific, you know, disciplines and systems that became the sine qua non of the modern mass consumption corporation, a model that spread all over the world and really was responsible for much of the wealth creation in the 20th century, which, in combination with democracy, mm -hmm. you know, lifted many boats not just the boats of the elite. So this is, this is a massive market opportunity. And if Apple doesn't pull up its sleeves and really dig into this, somebody will. And maybe it won't be some big corporation. Maybe it will be a coalition of other kinds of firms in a different kind of, of commercial configuration. But this kind of market failure begs 
for a competitive solution. Yeah, what's interesting is uh, Google has a very small rival called DuckDuckGo. Yes, of course. Uh, and they signed a deal with Apple this week to use Apple Maps when you search on, on DuckDuckGo. So yes, and so this baby, is this is Cook steps. listening to the criticism. Yeah. And you know, uh, for me, uh, I want to believe that there is still that kind of um, integrity and. Um, uh, bond with society, mm -hmm. bond with democracy, because in the in the end, our our business organizations, even our greatest businesses, live in society, and ultimately have to be interdependent with people. That's what makes not only market capitalism, but that's what has made market democracy such a successful model and, and you know and vision of a democratic and um, and uh, economically successful kind of future so um, I, I think that these things are possible we've accomplished them before we can accomplish them again so I want to talk about state solutions okay. uh, that's a very interesting yes, place to where you see what's happening around the world but uh, on the company front I think it's fairly clear that Google and Facebook are surveillance capitalism businesses. They would have to existentially change themselves. Existentially change themselves. The one company that you bring up in the book that made a transition yes. from a previous form of yes. market behavior yes. to what you term to be a surveillance form is Microsoft. Yes. yes. Um, as it happens, and Amazon, uh, in in a certain way, I think I think one could say that about Amazon. I you know with. I think Amazon has always been sort of in the data business. Um, They've always been in the data business, but I think that for quite a while there were very strict disciplines where the data was largely, if not entirely, used to improve its services. So those recommendation engines mm -hmm. and all the things that, you know, the customer service systems, all the things that they have that really made Amazon so incredibly successful. Um, you know, I think it's largely been, you know, I call that the, I don't want to introduce a lot of jargon, I, I call it the behavioral value reinvestment cycle, mm -hmm. that the data are getting reinvested into the, the service proposition. Um, and I think it's more recently that that has veered off into this new direction where the data are used in this, in this secondary kind of marketplace which we see now as Alexis, of course, being the apotheosis yeah. of that effort. So Amazon aside. Okay, was, sorry, uh, did sorry. I take no, you off fine. your question? Uh, well, no, I, I, I was very, I was on the Microsoft campus yeah. this week. Yeah. I had your book in my bag. Okay. It was an interesting time. Did and you I, show it to anybody? <laughs> I, I, t I asked Sasha Nadella, okay. CEO of Microsoft. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> hey, you know, I'm reading this very interesting book. It says Microsoft is, is in the surveillance data business. Uh, and he was very clear. He said, I believe, Microsoft believes, that privacy is a fundamental human right. We think that you should be able to opt out. We are working, we've heard this criticism. We've re-engineered the, you know, the various screens and windows so you can like, turn all off. And our business, Microsoft's business, is to help other businesses and people like, make more money. Right? Like, they don't think of themselves um, as an aggregator the way that Google does, right? It's going to suck in all the data and it's going to spit something out. He was very, he said this to me and to a room full of other journalists. We're a platform company. Other people build stuff on top of Microsoft and that is our goal. That's who we are. He, so it was very clear, right? He, he's saying the same things as Tim Cook. What makes you think that they don't have the same opportunity as Apple? Well, I, I think they perhaps could have the same opportunity, but I think a lot of things would have to change. And I think, you know, if you go into the data on Microsoft's digital assistant and how that works, as I do in the book, mm -hmm. and into some of the, um, you know, the, the, the very specific goals and plans, and Nadella himself saying that um, he regrets that Microsoft missed out on the targeted ad business uh, and that they were not able to make their search product, Bing, as successful as Google search 
because they didn't gather behavioral data mm -hmm. and they didn't use behavioral data both for improving bang and for uh, targeted advertising and that they're now trying to play catch up in that. So I, I think there are many, many, many elements and I, I point to them in detail and I, you know, and I document my arguments that show, and including the purchase of LinkedIn, which um, was explicitly discussed as a way to bring in a whole new dimension of behavioral data, you know, to uh, vastly increase Microsoft's knowledge graph and its social graph so that it could do much more with these behavioral data and have much more insight into these behavioral data. And so I think that, um, you know, that I have documented the ways in which Microsoft has moved in this direction. Mm -hmm. Nadella has been rewarded for those moves. He has been praised. Indeed, he has been adored for these moves, both by his own people and by the, the market, the stock market, uh, the analysts. Um, is it too late for Microsoft uh, to say, you know, we've seen the light, we see this market failure, uh, we want to get on the right side of history, the right side of humanity, the right side of the human future, the, the right side of democracy, and this is truly how we want to build and dedicate our business? I don't think it's too late. Mm -hmm. I think for, um, for Google and Facebook, you know, and I specifically talk about Microsoft sort of seeing this whole train going by of surveillance capitalism and sort of deciding with Nadella, we need to be, we need to be on that train too mm -hmm. because there's just too much revenue there that we're not participating in. But um, I think uh, Google and Facebook... Um, it, it, this is so fundamental to their DNA that it's hard to them for to for me to imagine uh, how there could be that kind of complete reinvention. Microsoft is still, you know, it's selling software. Its primary markets have always been its business customers, its clients that are buying its software and its enterprise software and all those kinds of things. So. You know, I think that Mark, Microsoft still has those openings, but I think that would require uh, a new level of commitment and discipline, and a very different picture of how it's going to how it's going to um, achieve its margins than the one that I've documented in this book. All right, so we just have a few minutes. Of course, it's time to talk about solutions. Okay, sir. So, uh, the ways that you solve a market failure. One, the market can solve it. Tim Cook and Satya Nadella can enter the world historic opportunity. It doesn't seem likely. Or others. Or others. And or others. Um, or the, the state can solve it, right? You can, you can correct the market. You have this great kind of paraphrase of, of Piketty, which is capitalism should not be consumed raw. Yeah. Um, so that we can regulate capitalism in some way. Yeah. I think we're seeing it in Europe with the GDPR, right? There's already been some changes there. The beginning. Um, there was a great stat from the New York Times, I think, today, you know, the GDPR was rolled out, the Times turned off its sort of like ad exchange model, the revenues have actually gone up, right? So you, you, don't, they, you don't need it maybe as much as, as you think you do. Market opportunity. Market there opportunity. I, I think the correlation is a little fuzzy, but <laughs> those are, right, the things happen. I don't know if they're ca causal relationship. But that, the, worth the, digging into. Worth, yeah, that, that's what they announced. Um, and then you're, there's a law in California that's going to come on. Yeah. Um, I spoke to Rokana, the, the representative from Congress. He told me on our podcast, the Virchast, if we don't have a data privacy law in the first six months of the new house, we need to like rethink our committee leaderships. There's, there's opportunity here. Um, there was a story, the carriers will just sell your location data in this country like crazy. The House Republicans are saying we need to hold hearings about carrier location data services. So there's movement. You, is that movement in a positive direction? Is it enough? This movement is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, it's critical. My theory of change in all of this is that, um, you know, we're talking about these deep structure historical transformations here. The, um, the digital, 
uh, surveillance capitalism. It's not just a simple business model. It's a uh, logic of accumulation is spreading all through the economy. Uh, it's not simply a question of regulating Facebook or regulating Google. Um, and I think uh, the first step to when, when we're talking about something that's uh, this kind of big historical movement, it's not like we can just have a five-point action plan and we can fix it up, you know, like in your typical business case. Mm -hmm. This is something where we need a fundamental shift in public opinion, where we, we already know what people's attitudes are, and we need to be able to translate that now into demands, into resistance, into outrage that gets the attention of our elected officials. And I think that has begun to happen. And, and what you're describing is the first inkling of that kind of process. The, the danger here is that we revert to the paradigms we already have, the antitrust paradigms, the privacy law paradigms. Let me say very clearly, these are terribly important. Mm -hmm. Privacy law, essential. Antitrust law, essential. However, it's not difficult to imagine fully implementing all of those laws and still not interrupting nor outlawing surveillance capitalism. I can use the example, for example, um, in Facebook. We break up Facebook on antitrust grounds, and we produce four smaller surveillance capitalists instead of one big one. Mm -hmm. So my message to our lawmakers is we need a new paradigm for regulation and legislation that will interrupt and outlaw surveillance capitalism. Every vaccine begins with a close understanding of the enemy disease. So we need to thoroughly understand the mechanisms and economic imperatives of surveillance capitalism so that we are designing our regulatory institutions and we are designing our laws to make it illegal to take my private human experience without my knowledge and my permission. Illegal to convert it into data for others' financial gain. Illegal to create prediction products about my future behavior to sell to others without my knowledge, let alone permission. That these behavioral futures markets themselves are illegitimate and perhaps should be outlawed altogether. So. Imagine the New York Stock Exchange, where I was yesterday, where all those trading desks are trading in the futures of human behavior. Mm -hmm. Is that the world we want and what the implications of that will be? So I would say we are at the beginning of a critically important process. We need market solutions and we need solutions from democracy. We need both. It's not an either or. And unless we have both, we are not going to have the human future that we all, and literally we all want. Well, that is as good a place to wrap up as any. Thank you so much, Shoshana Zuboff. Thank An you excellent book that I think you all should read. Thank you. If you'd like to view other Afterwards programs online, simply go to our website at booktv.org.